The content of this podcast is based on medical fact and evidence-based practice from credible authoritative sources, but is not a substitute for your institution's policies, procedures, common sense, or good judgment. The views and opinions are those of Eric Bauer and Flight Bridge Ed in their entirety. This is the Flight Bridge Ed Podcast, critical care and emergency medicine education for nurses and paramedics. Here's your host, Eric Bauer. Hey, y'all. This is Ashley Bauer. I am taking over the mic today, and we're going to focus on what's called mind over medicine, and it's navigating cognitive bias in emergency care. And as we discuss bias, I will start off by saying that there are almost 200 well-studied biases out there. And what we will discuss today will only touch the very surface of bias and its implication in our daily practice. So I'm sure that there are a lot of us right now that find ourselves in a somewhat difficult position. After the pandemic and recent healthcare changes, we can easily find ourselves overly stressed and burned out. However, we, we keep showing up, sometimes grudgingly, to work, pulling our shifts because there's really no other option. But I want you to stop and think for a second. Does this mindset affect how we treat our patients? Do you think that there are any adverse consequences of this mindset that we're unaware of when providing care? And what do you think this could potentially mean for our patients? I will say that most medical errors are corrected before they cause any patient harm, but not all are that lucky. Medical errors are now estimated to be one of the leading causes of death in our patients. What if I told you that by far, the greatest cause of errors are from our own thinking and feelings and how they impact our decisions? So after any event, we always want to ask ourselves why, right? You want to determine the root cause of the issue so that an appropriate solution can be identified. You want to work your way from the most proximal cause to the most distal cause to try to find that root cause. So let's look at just a a broad example, right? The adverse event is the sinking of the Titanic. So you start off by asking yourself, well, why did it sink? Well, because it had a hole in its side, right? That's the most proximal cause. So then you go down from there. Well, why did it have a hole in its side? Well, because it hit an iceberg. Well, why did it hit an iceberg? And so on, right? And this gets us to our distal cause, which again will get us to our ultimate cause that we can potentially find a solution for. However, in healthcare, we rarely take the cognitive issues into effect when trying to determine the root cause of a problem. We don't take the human factors into consideration. It's a lot easier to focus on things that are tangible and measurable. And so the purpose I want here is to take a look at some specific cases and see where the patient safety aspect went wrong. There's a lot of psychology behind bias and how it affects us and our decisions in healthcare, and this really isn't the place to deep dive into that. So what is cognitive bias and what does it have to do with me and my practice? Cognitive bias is the process by which the brain simplifies information it's given based upon our prior personal life experiences and overall preferences. And it's really a coping mechanism that allows the brain to take massive amounts of information at once and filter it and simplify it quickly. Essentially, it allows us to find mental shortcuts. And in most instances, this is an effective method for us to be able to process busy situations. However, it's really what also causes errors in our thoughts and overall actions. Now, I will say that all biases are considered probable. And we say that because they are invisible and there's no way of proving 100% that they occurred However, as we reflect on situations, it's often possible to describe a bias that contributed to what transpired. You cannot say for certain that the bias was responsible for a particular behavior, but inferences can certainly be made that the bias was probable. Now, most medical providers, no matter what area you are in, have not received training or education when it comes to clinical decision-making or recognizing bias. It was always assumed that you would receive that upon entering practice and by mentors in your field. But educators are increasingly realizing that clinical reasoning is critically important to practice, yet we continue not to focus on it. Most situations, especially as in the cases we're about to discuss, 
do not involve one bias alone. The majority of cases can have three, four plus biases, and this may be due to one bias occurring frequently with another or influencing another. So this is important to remember when you're trying to determine potential biases when evaluating a case. So let's look at this first case, and we're gonna call this case uh, the case of the subdued skateboarder. And you've got a 22 year old male that was brought into the ER via private vehicle by his friends. They wheeled him into the triage area. The patient was triaged with, you know, the following information provided. The patient is from a men's addiction and recovery center for heroin addiction. He left this morning with his skateboard to go to Life Skills for Counseling Services. And upon returning to the facility, he was complaining of feeling sleepy. His friend said that he just, you know, really wasn't acting right. They did a drug test at the facility. It was negative. In the triage note, it's, it's noted that patient is sleepy, but oriented times three. So patient vitals, 97.4 degrees uh, Fahrenheit temp, heart rate of 90, respiratory rate of 18, blood pressure 140 over 96, O2 100% on room air. So the ED was full that day. All hall beds are occupied, multiple holds. This individual was placed back out in the waiting room to await an open bed for further evaluation. So when we talk about triage levels, this individual was given a triage level of four, which basically means semi-urgent, but not life-threatening. So two hours later, he was placed in a room. Upon entering the room, the patient is noted to be slumped over in a wheelchair. And at that time, he was noted to have a GCS of about 12. Now, his friends had already left at this point and went to question the triage nurse further, who basically added that his friends just said he wasn't acting right. There was no other information aside from the initial complaint that was provided at the time of triage. Now, obviously, this patient was immediately placed on a stretcher for a more complete evaluation. Um, immediately, you could tell that just something was not right, right? And this is one of those patients that if you've been in practice long enough, you know, you look at this patient and something in your gut just does not sit right with you. Well, this would be this patient. He was well kept, otherwise no obvious outward signs of trauma. The triage note said no history or current meds. So again, upon initial evaluation, there's nothing at all that is standing out for why this patient is presenting the way that he is, right? So a more thorough evaluation was completed and he was found to have a, just this really small hematoma over the right occipital area. Did not appear to be tender to palpation. There was no obvious bleeding. No further injury was noted. Everything else was completely unremarkable aside from this one finding. So he was immediately sent for a CT of the head, which demonstrated an increased density in the right sylvian fissure, which is suspicious for subarachnoid hemorrhage. So a CTA was completed, which showed normal vessel appearance. There was a small, a non-displaced fracture line to the right occipital bone that was noted as well. Now this patient ended up recovering with no significant adverse problems. And while this case wasn't a, a truly sentinel event, it very much could have gone another way and potentially put this young man's life in danger. All because the triage nurse allowed her own biases to get in the way of the clinical picture that was sitting in front of her. So upon review of this case, the main bias that initially stands out is termed anchoring. And an anchoring bias is the tendency for the brain to fixate on one particular symptom, sign, or piece of information, or even a particular diagnosis early on in the diagnostic process, and then failing to make any adjustments for other possibilities either by you know, discounting them or just ignoring them altogether. And while this is sometimes effective, it can also have a very powerful influence on people who fail to adjust their initial opinion, even when the later information they receive contradicts that. So in this situation, the triage nurse took the initial information she was given of the patient currently residing in a halfway house due to previous heroin addiction and formed an opinion of his current state. Right? She attributed his sleepiness and not acting appropriately as an indication that he had likely just relapsed and just taken something while he was out for the day. So it's important for us to be able to analyze and understand what cognitive and affective biases may have contributed to these cases. But it's even more important that we're able to attempt to overcome biases to make ourselves better providers. And so to overcome an anchoring bias, 
you really need to gather sufficient information, right? It's developing that list of differential diagnoses. It's considering every single possibility that could be going on with this patient and always considering worst case scenarios. Doing these things will help your mind to consider other possibilities and allows you to possibly look into the situation further to rule out those other possibilities rather than settling on the initial first diagnosis or opinion that you formed. Now, another common bias that's often a result of anchoring bias is premature closure, which accounts for a high proportion of misdiagnoses in a lot of patients. And premature closure is the tendency to close the decision-making process prematurely and accept a diagnosis before it's been completely verified. So the problem is that once the diagnosis is made, your thinking stops, right? There, there's a failure to search for information to challenge that provisional diagnosis or even to consider other diagnoses. And this bias tends to occur simultaneously with anchoring as they are kind of closely related. Again, in this case, the nurse closed her thinking to any other potential cause of the patient's presentation except for relapse. She accepted that as the diagnosis, which caused her to stop thinking and considering other diagnoses or asking any further questions. So how can we break through this bias? Well, one, again, is overcome by gathering sufficient information. The key is really developing that list of differential diagnoses, identifying any red flag symptoms and investigate those appropriately. And then again, consider those worst case scenarios. These are the things that you absolutely do not want to miss or cannot afford to miss in these patients. All right, so let's look at another case, and we're going to call this the case of the misfortunate mommy. And so this is an EMS provider who's called to the home of a 27-year-old female that passed out. And upon arrival, you find your patient sitting at the kitchen table, appears to be in no apparent distress. You find out that she's five days postpartum mom, a vaginal delivery of a 39-week gestational infant without complications. She was discharged home three days ago after an uneventful hospitalization after, obviously, childbirth. So let's look at the sequence of events that kind of led you here. So just prior to calling the ambulance, she fainted while standing up doing dishes. Now, her husband said that he was standing nearby. She did not harm herself as he was able to help her to the ground. He reports that she was out maybe one to two minutes and then slowly came back. He denies any type of seizure activity. Now, her husband does say that she's had little sleep and a lot of increased stress, obviously due to a new baby at home. The baby's been crying a lot. She's having to breastfeed constantly just to console the baby. She does have a history of anxiety, but does not currently take anything and has not taken anything since she found out that she was originally pregnant. Um, Mom does say that she's feeling much better now. She feels a little anxious, but has no specific complaints, specifically denies chest pain or difficulty breathing. Um, But her husband was adamant about calling EMS and having her evaluated. She denies any prior history or similar episodes or any other significant medical history. And mom just says that she doesn't feel she needs to be seen. You kind of agree. She looks great. She has no complaints. Now, while you're gathering this history, your partner checks her blood glucose, which was 108. Um, Again, mom says that she doesn't really feel like she needs to be seen, but she does agree for you to do a 12-lead EKG, which does demonstrate sinus tachycardia with a rate of 112 with no other acute abnormalities noted. Mother again says, you know, she feels silly that you were even called. She doesn't think that she needs to be transported. You kind of agree. You don't see anything alarming here. She looks great. She has no current complaints. So again, you leave. You get called back an hour later for a female patient in cardiac arrest. She's transported and pronounced dead shortly after arrival at the hospital. So what happened here? And there's a lot going on with this case. But really the big thing is pulmonary embolism. And unfortunately, PE is often a very difficult diagnosis. And some studies have shown the diagnosis being missed almost 50% of the time on initial presentation. The symptoms are not always specific and vary significantly from patient to patient. Not all patients present with that chest pain, 
and most do not even always have tachycardia. The physical exam can be completely normal in these patients early on. Now, confirmation bias, that's the next bias that we're going to talk about. And this tends to be a fairly common bias in healthcare. And it's the tendency to seek confirming evidence to support your initial diagnosis rather than searching for disconfirming evidence to refute it. So essentially, you're interpreting the information gained to fit that preconceived diagnosis rather than the converse. You see what you want to see, basically. So in this instance, the EMS crew preconceived that she's a new mother who's overly stressed and just not used to the situation. And again, you've got this mother that's confirming that all this information is true and that has to be the only reason for the problem, for the symptoms that she's experiencing. They miss the possibility of a PE given that, one, she's anxious, she was tachycardic, and she's high risk because she's just given birth five days postpartum at this point. Now, overcoming confirmation bias is very similar to what we've discussed with anchoring and premature closure, right? You have to ask the questions and you have to be open to other diagnoses. Again, it comes down to paying attention to those red flags that may be present and always consider those worst case scenarios and ensure that you aren't ignoring facts and big flashing signs that are pointing you down the correct road. Now, another bias that we'll look at is overconfidence, and that's sometimes referred to as a lack of humility. And this one tends to occur, again, pretty closely with confirmation bias. And this is the belief that we know more than we do. The EMS crew acted on incomplete information and on their confidence that it was just stress-related. Too much faith was placed in their opinion instead of carefully gathering a history and further information. Now, we see this in other areas as well. There's a lot of biased overconfidence, particularly common in women's healthcare, blindness in diagnosing women who are experiencing chronic pain, autoimmune diseases, reproductive problems, even heart attacks, other life threatening emergencies have been attributed to just a lack of understanding and stereotyping of women. And this doesn't just apply to women, this applies to, you know, other races as well. So, how can you overcome overconfidence? The big thing is an awareness of what we do not know can be a lot more important than what we do know. And this isn't always the case, but it does occur more frequently than most of us would like to admit. Sometimes humility can be devalued in our society, especially within the medical field, right? Patients appreciate those confident providers, and at times they may perceive the lines between humility and insecurity as being blurred. Acknowledging uncertainty and implementing ways to gain more certainty, like asking more questions, consulting a colleague or director, or just reviewing more literature, can ultimately gain you more patient confidence and appreciation. It's the recognition that overconfidence is a common cognitive error, that the more you are aware of its existence, the more you can do to mitigate its potentially detrimental effects. So just be aware that You don't know what you don't know. And we say that all the time, but, you know, practice humility and an openness to learning on a regular basis, constantly just ask yourself more questions. For example, you know, what might I be missing here? Or what else could this set of symptoms mean? What else could I ask the patient to gain more understanding of their current situation? And to safely navigate the care of patients, we have to be aware of the blind spots in our own perspectives. Let's face it, I mean, humility can be unpleasant. After all, it is hard to accept our limitations, ignorance, overall inadequacies, but it is absolutely imperative in helping to overcome this bias. Now, the last case we're going to look at is the case of frequent flyer Freddie. Now, Freddie is a frequent flyer well known to both the EMS and hospital system. And we all know a couple of Freddies of our own, I'm sure. He does have a past medical history of obesity hypertension, type 2 diabetes, and chronic pain. Now, he called EMS due to low back pain that he rates as 10 of 10 for the past two days. He was picked up at EMS. He was transported to the local hospital per request. Now, upon arrival in the ED, he tells the provider that his pain is sharp, it's across his entire low back, and it's worse with bending over. Now, this pain radiates down both legs, stops at about his calf, nothing makes the pain better, 
Um, he says he's also been constipated. He's been taking his medications at home for that. This just isn't helping. He says he had an episode of bowel incontinence earlier at home after taking all these medications, obviously. Um, and he states that he, he can't stand because he's, he's just in so much pain. So the ER provider diagnosed him with acute on chronic back pain, sent him home to follow up with his primary provider. Now, Freddie called EMS again the next morning due to continued back pain, says he can't walk to the bathroom because of the pain. He was taken back to the ED where it was noted that he was seen the day previous and he was discharged back home. He called EMS again later that evening with the same complaints and an episode of urinary incontinence, which was charted in the EMS chart as the patient not wanting to tolerate the pain and go to the bathroom, so he chose to urinate on himself. Now, the EMS crew spoke with the patient um, and said, you know, look, you've already been to the hospital twice. They gave you the same diagnosis. They sent you home. Do you really think you need to go again? So anyway, long story short, Freddie signed his refusal. So Freddie called EMS again in two days with continued pain. He's unable to walk. He's unable to urinate for over 10 hours now. So this time, Freddie demands transport to the hospital. Now, the triage report from the EMS crew to the receiving nurse in the ER was that this patient was a regular and likely seeking narcotics. He was still complaining of pain, even though he had been seen twice already and sent home. Nothing new to report. He saw a different provider in the ER that day who immediately ordered an MRI, where he was subsequently admitted and taken to OR for decompression surgery for cauda equina syndrome. Now, this patient ultimately sustained some long-term complications, including bladder and bowel dysfunction, and significant muscle weakness in the lower extremities, leading to the use of a wheelchair for overall mobility. Now, I know that after, you know, reading this scenario or looking at this scenario, there are a lot of red flags that automatically stand out to you, but there was so much communication that was lost or dropped in this patient due to the presence of biases. And the most obvious thing is that one should never assume that a patient with chronic back pain hasn't progressed to a neurologic emergency. That's the first big thing. So on the first ED visit, there was no mention of questioning regarding saddle distribution of pain, reflexes were noted as two plus throughout, and it was noted that imaging was not ordered as it was not medically necessary at that time. Now the patient was complaining of bilateral sciatica, and that should be a red flag, but it was seemingly ignored in that first chart. Now, on the second ED visit, there is no mention of questioning saddle distribution of pain. There is no specific neuro exam that was completed, including reflex or sphincter examination. And there's no mention of imaging that was noted. Neither note specifically addressed the bowel incontinence, except for the note of constipation in the original triage note. All right, so let's take a look at some biases here. So the first big one that we're going to talk about is posterior probability error. And this is the likelihood for a particular problem being influenced by what has happened before for the particular patient. So the expectation is that the sequence will continue. If it has happened repeatedly in the past, there's a higher likelihood that it is the same problem now. So therefore, in this patient, they were a, quote, you know, frequent flyer for chronic back pain it was never anything serious prior, so the same must be true now. Now, another common bias that, that goes along with posterior probability error is ascertainment bias. And that's where our thinking is shaped by prior expectations. So you see what you expect to see. What was true yesterday is true today and will be true tomorrow. So people who frequent the ER for pain are just seeking pain medications. Nothing else, right? So the healthcare providers who dealt with Freddie in this case explained away his condition based on his history of chronic pain and frequent visits to the emergency department and being labeled as drug seeking. And really and truly, this is also a form of stereotyping. It's explaining a patient's condition on the basis of their disposition or character rather than seeking a valid medical explanation. So the EMS report to the nursing staff upon the last transfer can also do a lot to set up these expectations in others and can ultimately seal that patient's fate. So what are some specific ways that you can try to break through these two types of bias? 
One is just remembering that every patient and provider are unique individuals. We tend to be biased towards certain patients, such as, you know, those with psychiatric illness or drug alcohol addiction. And so we want to avoid the rush to stereotype patients based on their culture, gender, illness, religious, sexual orientation, and so on. And to acknowledge that you may not have the best rapport with a certain type of patient, but you have to make sure that you take particular care on how this may impact your decision making and overall judgment. And I always kind of throw myself in this situation and I'll be honest and say that I have a very difficult time with people who are very whiny when they're sick. And I know that sounds bad, so don't don't pass judgment. Everybody has their own bias, right? But I understand that you're sick. The more that you whine about it and complain, it doesn't do anything for me. As a matter of fact, it kind of turns me off even more. Tell me what's wrong. Let me try to get to the bottom of it, point blank. So I have to keep that in check, right? I have to make sure that I don't allow that person and their tendencies or traits to affect how I care for them. I have to pull myself out and say it has nothing to do with what's going on with them. It's just how they're manifesting it. And I have to really keep that in check. Now, again, everybody has their own type of bias. It's just important that you're able to acknowledge that, that you're able to see that, and that you're able to kind of push that to the side and not let that interfere or dictate how you care for your patient. Now, one other thing we'll talk about here is called the bandwagon effect. And remember that we've already said that diagnostic labels can stick to a patient. So if everyone else thinks it, it must be right, right? It's that natural tendency for individuals to follow along with what others are doing. And in the healthcare setting, it can easily be that the providers prior to you did not feel that this was a big deal, so you shouldn't either, right? So in the case of Freddie, the second ED visit seemed to be just based on what the first provider determined was going on. There was no consideration that it was anything more And the second provider he saw diagnosed him with the exact same thing and sent him home with the exact same discharge instructions. Again, no further consideration was given. So what can we do here? There there are a couple of ways that you can break through or overcome bandwagon bias. And one would be assess all patients appropriately, right? Consciously decide on your own diagnosis, regardless of the label that was placed by others. And then just take the time to do a a quick timeout to reconsider other differential diagnoses that may be present. We also go back to anchoring bias. And anchoring bias is definitely present in this case. It's that premature setting on a single diagnosis based on just a few important features of the initial presentation and failing to adjust as new information becomes available. So in this case, gosh, there were so many things that changed or presented themselves and no one gave them any consideration. Starting out, he was complaining of bilateral sciatica. That's automatically a, you know, kind of red flag that says maybe I should look a little bit deeper into this. He complained of bowel dysfunction, urinary retention and incontinence, and just a decrease in mobility, et cetera. Like there were several things here that should have caught somebody's attention and it didn't. All of those previous providers were so fixated on his history of chronic pain and being labeled as a frequent flyer, that they failed to adjust to the possibility of something more severe, even though the information was right there in front of them. All right, so we've talked a lot about different biases that we can easily encounter in daily practice, but how do we rewire our way of thinking to affect change in ourselves? And I think the first step in enhancing our understanding of clinical decision-making is just understanding and being aware of our own bias and working to improve that. And this can often be easier said than done. However, just learning about cognitive biases is a great step in just developing awareness of potential cognitive errors. It's important to slow down. Take your time. This allows you to think about the situation and induces that slow and deliberative reasoning so it makes you think twice. Take that time for that cognitive pause with each and every patient. We talk about metacognition and that's that awareness of and insight into one's own thought process. And so to help with anchoring, it's important to always consider the opposite, right? Again, it it makes you stop and slow down and go, oh yeah, that could potentially be a possibility as well. And while metacognition 
may not have a lot of support in medicine, there may be some benefits in some circumstances as well. Another big thing is using checklists. And that forces us to think in a more ordered fashion. Now, I know that there's a lot of debate out there about are checklists good, are they not, whatever. But in the setting of bias, a checklist allows for cognitive unloading by providing a decision aid and a differential diagnostic list, right? It challenges your structure of thought and it forces cognition onto certain topics, even if they were not previously considered. And then encourage a culture of accountability and feedback, right? We want a culture that recognizes that humans make mistakes and try to address any of those systemic issues that may have contributed to those mistakes. Encourage rapid feedback, which allows for early examination of cognitive biases, and that's going to help you work through to improve those biases. Learning about an error months down the road really doesn't help you better yourself. This has to be a pretty quick turnaround for you to be able to actively reflect and learn from those mistakes. And then unfortunately in the setting that we're in, we deal with fatigue a lot, but it is important to address that fatigue, minimize that time pressure. And I know that this is not easy to do with having to meet you know, certain scene time requirements and things like that, but it does help with optimal cognitive processing Listen, healthcare isn't perfect. We're always going to come across situations that's like, well, you know, this is stopping me from doing this or this is stopping me from doing that. And that is true. And I don't have an answer to all of those as well. There are a lot of system problems that need to be addressed for this to truly happen. But in the meantime, again, focus on yourself, focus on overcoming those personal biases to, again, provide the best patient care possible. As always, if you have any questions, concerns, want to discuss anything further, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, My email address is ashley.bauer at flightbridget.com, or you can always reach out via the website. Thank you. This has been a production of the Flight Bridge Ed Podcast, leading the way in pre-hospital critical care and emergency medicine education.